Finally, we end this overly long episode with Orphan Sky and Sorcery. This was one of the earliest PS2 games I'd ever played, either third or fourth, back when my grandmother was the only one with the PS2. After a few weeks of just Dead or Alive 2 and Disney's Dinosaur, she got this and Eternal Ring on the same day. This isn't that same copy I'm playing on, I bought this one back in 2012. When I recorded this back in 2018, it would have been about 16 years since I last played it. It's based on the 94-03 light novel series Sorcerer Stabber Orphan, which I have no experience with at all. Although you don't really need to have any exposure to the original series because this game is not adapting it, instead having its own original story. First thing I do is pick the battle training option to remind myself how this game works. These have you playing as the titular orphan student, Magnus, as often explains the battle mechanics. The first one is simply targeting enemies. Orphan also explains that there are more than just enemies to target sometimes, like this ball of energy that recovers health when attacked. The second is about shielding with the square button. It's a block. There's a little bit of startup to it, so you can't just block right before the enemy is about to hit you. You have to pay a little attention. The third has a start exploring Orphan's moveset, starting with his sword, the Sword of the Fallen Devil. It's the close range attack. By timing the X button as you hit, you can add another two hits onto the attack. Holding the button has you charge the sword's length, which can have you get other close enemies in the same slash. Fourth covers the elemental spells with Circle. These attacks cover a wide range, holding the button increases the area of the effect. Holding it for a while without being interrupted will have you summon an elemental spirit to pull off the spell. This one is called a Bite of Lightning. Because of the enemies I'm trying to out honour in the water, and this was an electric spell, it created a terrain effect to do more damage. Next is projectile attacks with the triangle button. Obviously these are hitting enemies without needing to get in close. Holding the button will have you fire multiple projectiles at all nearby enemies. Then there's reflective spells. Certain elemental shields will reflect enemy attacks when timed right, but only when the shield and enemy elements match. Finally, there's cooperative attacks. If an allies attack leaves a ball floating around an enemy's head, I can fire my own projectile attack to combine the two for extra damage. With that done, I can now start the game. We get an animated cutscene with Orphan, Magnus and Cleo walking through a part town before being stopped by these two guys, Vulcan and Dartin, who apparently owe Orphan money. Orphan blows them up, but they get back up and Vulcan claims to know a place that will get them easy money to pay Orphan back. The cutscene then focuses on this ship and these three other travellers. Later that night, on said ship, Orphan complains about the storm stopping him from sleeping. Meanwhile, Dartin is also worried about the storm while Vulcan is seasick. Vulcan also asks when they'll reach their destination, Arvin Rama. Dartin says it'll be three days. Turns out the trick is a scam. They got Orphan to pay for them to get on the boat with promises of easy money working for a merchant there. Although Dartin does worry that they may have got on the wrong ship. We then get to see what some others are doing. The pink-haired woman is missing some guy called Rufus, and Magnus and Cleo are arguing over having to share a cabin. Magnus thinks he saw something outside, and after Cleo tells him it was just rain on the window, something makes her scream. They come into Orphan's room screaming about flying snakes. This puts me in control of Orphan. I can fire projectiles, jump and swing the sword. I leave Orphan's cabin for another cabin to break open, revealing the large armoured man swinging at some giant wasps and not really putting any effort in. Cleo tells Orphan to help, but the ceiling collapses between them, separating them. I enter the room opposite to Magnus and Cleo's cabin to find it ransacked and Cleo's luggage stolen. This leads to the two having another argument before Orphan shuts them up. In here is a chest with my first emerald incense, a healing item. Through the door at the end of the hallway is a chest with a blue incense. The second chest I open here triggers the cabin to flood. This is the first time I'm asked to save, which just happens after certain cutscenes. There's another chest, but it's just another emerald incense. I then return to Orphan's room for... You know, I had a bad feeling about this trip from the very start. Well then, why didn't you tell us before? I did tell you before, but you ignored me. Shut up already! There's more important I'm with Orphan. These two are insufferable together. I wonder if it has something to do with localization or voice direction. Cleo especially feels like someone on the localization team hated her and deliberately had a more annoying aspect magnified. Unless she really is that annoying in Japanese too. The flooding washed away the debris blocking me off from the rest of the floor. The first one on the left has the pink-haired woman climbing a rope outside a window and telling us we should get going. I then go inside. I hope that lady made it up the rope okay. Who knows? I'm hoping we'll live to find out. It's also worth pointing out that Orphan is voiced by a pre-MGS2 Quinton Flynn. I wonder if he even remembers doing this. The room opposite has Cleo wondering about the big guy. His room has a chest containing some sleeping chimes, which put monsters outside of battle to sleep for 30 seconds. I don't think I ever bother with them. You don't really need them. Further on in the hallway is blocked off again. The room on the left is abandoned, while the left contains Vulcan and Dart in desperately stealing the contents of the room before the ship sinks. Orphan does not approve, and Vulcan slams a door shut on him. Then they hear a crash and Dartin scream. 
Orphan's glad to have a fight. A giant crab breaks into the room and chucks Vulcan into the water, and no tears were shed. This leads into the first battle and first boss of the game, the Ingorudo. I start by trying my projectile, the Hand of Pyro. As you would guess by the name, it's a fire elemental spell. The Ingorudo starts off by walking up to me and whacking me with its claws. Enemy health is indicated by the red diamonds on top of the screen, while Orphan's is blue at the bottom. Eventually the Ingorudo starts wandering back and forth in the water, and I start casting the Bite of Lightning instead. After it takes that hit, it starts spitting bubbles at me. Once I remove the rest of its health, it comes off and chases him deeper into the ship until it dies and a horde of gargics burst out of his body. They're no threat, a single fully charged bite of lightning wipes them all out. For clearing a boss I gain a new spell and get the voice of Paul Eiding explaining it to me. This one is a shield of immunity, which reflects poison attacks. It's the one Orphan explained to Magnus in the tutorial. Magnus and Cleo show up again and when Orphan asks where they were, the boat starts shaking again. Turns out the boat is sinking. So I head up the stairs into the next room. I go through the door on the right for another two emerald incensors and a blue incense. I then leave that room and take the doorway on the left. There are two doors on each end of this hallway, so of course Magnus and Cleo argue over which door to take. When Arthur gets fed up with them, the hallway fills with smoke. It doesn't matter which door you take, they both lead to the same screen. Out on the deck, I get attacked by some more flies and they even manage to get a couple hits on me. It's here that I get to choose which of the game's three story paths I'm going to follow, each one focusing on one of the three travellers. For the first one I choose to meet up with Magnus and the pink haired woman, Sefi. Magnus explains that she was being attacked by the monsters and he saved her. She makes a comment on Orphan's amulet and Magnus says that they can't leave her behind. I can choose to turn her down for another path, but I'll start with hers. Whatever, she's going to need more protection than you can provide, so you two come with me. I love how Orphan always sounds just slightly fed up the entire game. I mean, I feel that way after 20 minutes of Cleo and Magnus in the same room. Who knows how long he's had to deal with them. Suddenly, a giant sea serpent rises from the ocean and sets the boat on fire. Orphan tells Sephi and Magnus to hide, leading into another boss fight against the Garriga. When he passes over me, I have to hit it with the Hand of Pyro and block when it fires its electricity at me. The Bite of Lightning can also be useful as well. After a few cycles of this, it rises into the clouds and blows up the mast I'm standing on, leaving Orphan to jump to another. There's three masts, and when all are destroyed, it's game over. It doesn't get that far though, as I keep up the pattern, even sometimes getting two hits in per cycle. It blows up the second mast, and not long after, I get in the final hit. The Garriga rises one more time to die. For this boss, I'm awarded the electric projectile spell, the Bolt of Thunder. It's too late for the boat, and the damage is already done. Even then, one more Bolt of Lightning hits to split it in half and sink it faster. We then get treated to look at this weird egg-looking thing with three eyes, and a mysterious woman being affected by it. Once she's able to stand, it projects Orphan's silhouette into one of its eyes. Orphan himself is stranded with Magnus and Sephi. They assume Cleo washed ashore, we won't be seeing Cleo for a while, and thank fuck for it. The longer her and Magnus are kept away from each other, the better. Magnus is way less annoying when he's not bickering with her. Sephi says that they've washed up on Chaos Island. When Orphan says they should have washed up near Arvin Rama, Sephi says that the ship was bound to Chaos Island and Arvin Rama is in the complete opposite direction. Magnus figures out that Vulcan got them on the wrong ship. When Magnus says he had a bad feeling from the beginning, but Orphan never listens, Orphan tells him to shut up. It's like his catchphrase. Shut up already! Oh, shut up! Shut up, Magnus! Shut up! Did you shut up? Oh, shut up. Oh, shut up. Oh, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Shut up. Oh, shut up. Shut up. Sephi suggests they get out of the rain first and then figure things out. Often says they should also look for Cleo too. I follow the only path available that crumbles as I walk along it. Of course, there are chests on the way, including the new item Emerald Lantern, which has the exact same function as the Emerald Incense. Same health restored. You can view a map of the area here, which is slightly helpful since this area is so dark it's hard to make a lot of it out. I keep going and Magnus complains about a tree blocking the path. I use my projectile to burn it down. Another new item past it is the Ball of Shadow, a darkness element weapon for Sephi. I find an old tower. Sephi says they can get inside to dry off, but often doesn't know to trust it or not. Sephi has to climb the tower and lower the drawbridge to get the others in. And so I play a Sephi, jumping across to the side of the tower to climb the vines. Well, first I rub up against the vines from every angle until I get the correct one that lets me climb. The vines make a sort of maze I have to slowly climb my way across until I reach the hole near the top. Once inside, she gets attacked by three lizard men. Sephi plays similarly to Orphan, so I don't have to worry about a new moveset. She has her own projectile and her own elemental spell, Dance of Ice. She fights with the whip, with the ball equipped to changing the element. There are also two lamps on the ceiling that I can attack to deal huge damage to the two lizard men on the sides. This makes it a rather easy fight and I only get hit once. This gets me the lizard man added to Orphan's picture book. The picture obtained from the fight depends on how well you did in that fight. 
I believe it's based on time taken, but here is a problem. I technically don't 100% the game, because I don't get all the pictures. There are a limited amount of battles in the game, and you can get duplicate pictures. There is nowhere on the internet that I'm aware of that catalogues all the pictures and how and where to get them. This leaves me with no way to know what I'm missing and how to get what I'm missing. That's obviously because this game has basically been forgotten. Now, although I will count the game as conquered when I beat it, I am willing to come back and redo it at a later date should the methods of gaining every picture book entry become available. After the fight, Sephila was the drawbridge and jumps down so everyone can get in through the front door. I often questions how she can jump from so high without injuring herself, and Sephi says it's because she's a dancer. Okay, so I don't dance, ever. So I don't know, does being able to dance give you the power to jump from three or four stories unscathed? Often just wonders why a dancer will get on a ship alone to Chaos Island. She says she came to pay respect to her fiancé Rufus, who died on the island. It was a long time ago. Mm. Could at least pretend to give a shit, Orphan. She asks a favour before they enter the tower. Orphan says they have to find Cleo, but when Sephi says she can pay them in gold because she's been preparing for this trip for years, he changes his mind. Magnus tries to offer their help for free, but Orphan kicks him and tells him to shut up before accepting. They head into the tower, but when Magnus asks if Orphan forgot about Cleo, Orphan brushes it off, saying they'll find her later. We get shown the map screen that informs us that this place is called the Tower of Mercy. At this point I turn the game off for a bit. When you come back to a save, you can look at the picture book or listen to the diary, where Magnus and Cleo will narrate what happened so far in case you haven't played for a while. As for the Tower of Mercy, right away I have a swinging blade trap to get past. Orphan decides to go through alone. Just got to time my movement right to get past them. The camera doesn't help here, hanging out behind the wall. It's a very sensitive camera too, one press of a shoulder button has it launching itself in that direction. Gotta give it the lightest taps you can. Go through a few of them, getting a couple emerald lanterns on the way. When I get to the end, Magnus and Sephi have already caught up with no trouble. I often say as they took their time, but it was two seconds. Often standards are ridiculous. After Orphan mocks Magnus for calling the tower creepy, they all get on a lift to the next floor. On the next floor, Orphan once again tells the others to stay back while he jumps across some rotating platforms above some spikes. Falling in just deals a little bit of damage and puts you back to the beginning. There's only two platforms though and I pick up the emerald incense next to the lift and take it to the next floor. There's an emerald lantern by the start here and a summoning bell that attracts enemies at the other side. There are these spinning pillars with platforms on them. I climb them until I can jump to this ledge with the next lift. The chest next to the lift here has another enemy attracting item, the perfume scented bag. For this room I have to reach the next lift by jumping over some cogs. On this next floor it looks like Orphan has reached a dead end until he gets ambushed by some lizard men. After a little bit, another enemy, a beholder, will sneak attack Orphan in time for Magnus and Sephi to catch up. Orphan tells Magnus to go pull a lever, but Magnus is too scared and complaining about his every request. So Orphan also asks Sephi to go with him. I keep the enemies distracted with my spells, and also swinging the sword when they jump at me. Eventually, a bite of lightning finished them all off at once. For winning this fight, I get Beholder added to the picture book. Magnus pulls the lever and brags about it to Sephi, and then again to Orphan. It's just a lever. They then take another lift to the top floor of the tower. I just run along the outside of the room to another chest for an emerald lantern. I then pull the lever just right at the entrance. This lowers the pillar in the middle. Sephi gasps and runs to the middle, finding what she claims to be a piece of the crystal egg. Rufus told her about an artifact with the same name that was on Chaos Island. It supposedly has a strong enough aura to manipulate time. She's confused however because the crystal egg is supposed to be in a different tower. She worries she may have got Arthur and Magnus involved in something much bigger than she was expecting. Rufus told her that the tower was only recently completed, yet it looks very old. Sephi thinks that they may have been sent into the future. She doesn't know how far they've been sent, but she thinks they can also use it to transport backwards. She tries using the one fragment they have to send themselves back. It works. The tower is now no longer ancient. So they leave and now we're back in the abandoned pathways that led to the tower. The weather is much better and everything's in better shape. Orphan asks where Rufus' grave is and Sephi tells him it's in the middle of the island. Okay. Right away I go right for another emerald lantern and then check out the other right path for some sleeping chimes. The left side contains the emerald lantern and the path to the exit. Magnus stops everyone to point out that they can now walk down the stairs they are already walking down. On the next screen Magnus says he's picking up the smell of chocolate and points out where it's coming from. A tree, or the curing tree as Sephi calls it. Legend says that it blossoms on Chaos Island once every thousand years. Wow, that's amazing! Once in one thousand years? And we happen to come along at just the right time? I mean, you did just time travel to this point, so it's not as impressive as it could have been. After the cutscene, I swap out the Hand of Pyro for the Bolt of Thunder. Once again, I head across the pathways, which I find easier to navigate than in the last screen. Of course, I'm making sure to open the chests. 
One of them needs actual platforming to get to, which threw me off because Velasquez had invisible walls at the end of all the pathways. This one gets me a blue lantern which, like green, has exactly the same function as its same coloured incense. The last one has a smelly bag which stops enemies for 30 seconds. I head over to the east side and end up in a fight. There's a fire element in the middle with a few man-eaters, these plants, knife fish in the sea and this floating sea pig. The boulder thunder chews through the man-eaters and when the knife fish come close I can use a sword on them. The sea pig is the closest thing to a threat here as it grabs off and Z and I guess strangles him? But a spell from Sethi weakens it enough for me to get the last hits in. Knife fish gets added to the picture book. I walk forward a little and suddenly there's a glow under Orphan's foot. Once again they are sent time travelling. It's now winter here. Sethi realises Orphan stepped on another piece of the crystal egg and that there are probably many other pieces just lying around. Orphan wonders if they can just reverse the jump in time but Sethi doesn't think so. Magnus falls down and gets a telling off from Orphan for it. Orphan suggests they split up. By split up he means he goes on alone and the other two can catch up whenever. Any floor that isn't covered in snow is covered in ice. It means even this little slope I can't run up. I have to jump, which leads to me skidding down the other side and slipping into giant icicles and taking damage. They can be destroyed with sword though. Timing this when going down a slope is a pain though. They knew, because they put an emerald incense in a chest just before it. After that long slope I'm heading across a frozen version of the abandoned pathways I just came from. Doing the platforming across the water with these slippery floors and the icicles is quite nerve wracking. I get a purple lantern for it though, the strongest colour of healing item. The other chest doesn't get me anything new before I reach the spot in front of the curing tree from before and jump down onto a new path. Right after, Magnus and Sethi catch up to me. When Sethi complains about the cold, Magnus tries to help by casting a fire spell. Orphan tells him to stop but it's too late and he blows them all up. Orphan calls him an idiot and threatens to drop him as an apprentice if he tries that again. The ground shakes but it's not an avalanche, it's another battle. There are three Aegists, a hugger and a fire element in the middle. Right away I get stun locked into all their opening attacks. While I'm dealing with the Aegists, the hugger is constantly picking up Sephi and slamming her into the ground. None of them even acknowledge Magnus. Mainly spamming an uncharged bolt of thunder was my best strategy, most of us got interrupted by attacks from the Aegists. For killing them all, hugger was added to the picture book. I get walking in the direction the camera started me facing and have Magnus tell me it's the wrong way. So I turn and take the other path until Orphan steps on another crystal leg piece hidden under the snow. No one knows where they are now, and they also have the thick fog to deal with. So once again I'm walking across narrow stone paths at night. There's this weird ostrich thing to take out and a chest to open. When I get that and return the way I came, Magnus points out that we've already been here. Sephi offers to climb up these vines and look around up top for a way out. So I'm back to controlling Sephi again. There's a lever at the top of the vines that raises these very small pillars to jump across. Gotta be quick when jumping across them though because they sink quick. While jumping across them there's a chest containing another spell for Sephi, Dance of Darkness. I jump over to the curing tree and pull the lever next to it, which raises another path. She returns to Orphan and tells him she's opened the way out. She also says that the curing tree was in bloom, so they've probably returned to their own time. I'm now back in control of Orphan and can take the new path. As soon as I step on it, Steffi stops me to point it out to me. There's another chest to open on this path before I can finally leave the abandoned pathways behind and move on to the entrance to the aerial pathway. We've also left that irritating fog behind. There's two chests at the beginning, nothing new. I cross a few wooden bridges climbing higher and higher until Magnus and Sethi stop to look at the stars. Magnus nervously asks Sethi what Rufus was like. Sethi can see Magnus' obvious crush and subtly lets him down, as if this irritating teenager dressing like an 8 year old schoolboy had any chance. But she does talk about Rufus a bit. He was an archaeologist who quit his job to become a treasure hunter. She met him when she was a dancer at some royal palace and Rufus was called to appraise one of the royal family's items. She then goes on to reminisce about their time together and his stories about his travels. After they got engaged, she stopped receiving letters from him and eventually was informed that he got killed. Orphan, who was somewhere else, I don't know, comes in and changes the subject, asking Sethi if she's sure she's going the right way. She says that his grave should be nearby. So there's some more bridges to cross and a chest to open. At the end is the exit of this area, leading to the aerial pathway. First thing I do inside is get another emerald lantern, then follow the path to the other end. Orphan thinks it's a dead end, but Magnus points out a slot on the wall. Orphan says it's clearly a keyhole that will only open for the right pure-hearted person. While Orphan and Magnus argue over who should risk putting their hand in the slot first, Sethi goes ahead and does it. This opens the wall nearby. That just proves the pureness of Sethi's heart. She'll be no bad. We go into the tunnel and drop down in front of two rows of spikes. Orphan once again tells them to stay there and catch up later. Considering what's staring right back at them, I think Orphan just wants to get them killed so he doesn't have to deal with them anymore. I mean, I've already pointed out his lack of patience for Magnus, but he's also come across as completely uninterested in Sethi's story. If I step closer to the first row, another shoots forward, stopping me from jumping over it. 
I'm not sure what I did, but for whatever reason, they eventually moved back, so I jumped over. Then I can run under the rest and get another emerald lantern. In the corner is a hole to drop down. I spend a while jumping against this wall and failing to climb up until I see that there are some vines almost completely blending in with the wall that I can climb. Walking down this tunnel a little and the others catch up. The exit of this tunnel leads back outside again. I climb the vines while often just looks like he's doing a silly walk. The vines also sound like creaky stairs. At the end of the next path I drop down another hole to find a few decapitated statues. Even Arthur is unnerved. Walking around the back of one of the statues, I get hassled by a demon statue head. It tells them they have to answer a riddle to progress. If you look upon my form, your own form will I take. The entire world can fit inside me. Yet even a child may bear my weight. What am I? I run back into the tower I drop down and often finds himself being mocked by Vulcan. Darton points out that making fun of the sorcerer may not be smart, but Vulcan justifies it by saying that this situation is Orphan's fault, somehow. Orphan gets pissed and I have to scale a tower while Vulcan throws bombs at me. Reach the top and they run off, but Orphan catches him and picks him up. When Darton offers a secret in exchange for not being hurt, Orphan throws Vulcan away and interrogates him instead. The secret being that the answer to the riddle is Mirror. As thanks, Darton also gets thrown. I return to the face and answer the riddle. This makes a big block fall out of the wall, creating another path further down that everyone jumps down to. I get the one chest behind me for yet another enemy attracting item, the bug attractor, before entering the tunnel. I follow this next path on the other side, getting the strongest incense, the purple incense along the way. A couple steps past it, I'm in a fight. There are two grocks on either side of me, along with some irus, the flies, some electric elements, and a couple candlesticks the irus are floating around. Shooting the elements and candlesticks does most of the damage, and then it's just slashing the last of the grocks health away. I get grok added to the picture book. I head to the end of the path, and I'm once again entering another tunnel. Once again, Orphan tells the others to stand back and catch it later while he gets past these swinging blades. There's three, but you just have to walk past the one closest to the chest to reach the next tunnel. The next room has a spiked ball coming towards me, but I move out of the way. The camera is mostly obscuring another blade, leading me to get hit twice quickly and die. Dying returns to the title screen where you can reload over last save, which in this case is at the beginning of this indoor area. This will lead to problems later because cutscenes are unskippable in this game, but here is an issue. For my second try, I try to jump over the ball, but land on it and take damage. I land behind it though, so I'm fine, right? No, the fucker can reverse and finish me off. I manage to make my way across the third time and go up another tunnel. Now we have spiked crushers dropping from the ceiling. This one's easy, just have to walk slowly and keep an eye on the holes in the ceiling. This next one's even easier. Two swinging blades in a wide open room and no other traps. They put a purple incense in this one as if you're gonna get hit a lot. The exit leads me back outside where I meet up with Magnus and Sephi again. I once again follow the path up until I find another entrance behind a waterfall. This leads to a hallway with windows along the walls and torches outside. Suddenly Orphan stops and tells Magnus to hand back and take care of Sethi. Orphan runs off ahead and his hunch turns out to be correct as we enter a boss battle against the Minotaur. First thing it does is punch the ground to create a large wave of fire. It then follows up by charging into me and knocking me backwards. Get knocked too far and it's an instant kill. You can restart a fight from the beginning through the pause menu though. However, pause to change your equipment will also restart the fight. To actually damage it, you have to slash with the sword as it gets close to you. It's quite hard getting the timing down because sometimes Orphan will just run forward a bit before slashing, letting himself get hit. You just have to start slashing as he's already coming towards you. After a bit of damage, you'll start with the fire attack again too. You can also time a slash after one of those attacks. This is one of the few bosses I remembered from after the ship, and I'm fairly certain I did much better back when I was 9. Sometimes they'll stop a charge to take a swing at you that you can punish, but I don't know what causes this. But after a few retries and never quite figuring out all the boss's counters, I managed to kill him. My reward is the fire elemental spell, the pinnacle of the sun. When Magnus and Sephi catch up again, Magnus has to take the lead because he's been training under Orphan for a while and thinks he's ready for it. We then get another animated cutscene of them walking through more tunnels. Orphan has a bad feeling that turns out to be right when Magnus sets off a trap. Lucky for him, Sephi notices and saves him. Orphan's smug about being right, but when Sephi checks on him, Orphan just scowls at them for some reason. I don't know. The map screen informs me that I've arrived at a place called Gaia's Tomb. The group enters and... Orphan! Magnus! Oh no. Well, she's annoyed because she feels that Orphan and Magnus abandoned her. She's also been looking all over the island for them. She and Sephiri introduce themselves and she's surprised that Orphan's actually helping out another person, until Magnus lets slip that he's doing it to get paid. Orphan fills her in on what little they know, and when Cleo asks if they can go home now, Orphan says they still have to help out Sephiri. They argue and she storms off. I go up this ramp thing leading to another screen with a bridge to cross to enter this rest house. After stating their relief that Cleo is fine, Sephiri says that she thinks she should go alone from now. 
She thinks that since she's come this far, she can make the rest of the journey alone, since Rufus's grave should be below this tomb. She also doesn't want to cause any more trouble. Orphan's fine with it as long as he gets his payment, to which Sephi says she'll pay him when she gets home because she didn't actually bring any money with her. She goes off while Magnus tries to talk Orphan into stopping her, but Orphan says it's her decision and he can't change that. He instead says they should pick up Cleo and go home. I now have to run around this rest house and talk to everybody. Sephi and the main trio weren't the only ones to get here. There's also the big guy from the boat, Zeus. While Orphan and Magnus were with Sephi, Cleo has been helping out Zeus. He asks Orphan to thank her for him. In the other corner of this room is a kid we saw all the way back in the first cutscene, who we never actually ran into on the boat. This is Ma. Once again, Cleo has told him about Orphan. He asks Orphan if he can help him look for his mother, but Orphan turns him down for not having any money. He says he doesn't make exceptions, even for kids. I talk to Sephi again, who thanks Orphan again, and asks him to thank Magnus for her. She wishes him a safe journey home and leaves. I then go talk to Ma again. Um, you know that lady you were just talking to? Yeah. Uh, do you think she could be my mother? Huh? I wish I had a pretty mother like her. Uh, don't say it like that. Then he walks out too before the kid gets too creepy. I talk to Zeus again, who is concerned about Ma travelling alone as he reminds him of his missing daughter, who is a similar age. He also then leaves. I assume to stop Ma before he starts begging Sephi to adopt him. I go to Cleo, who just says she isn't talking to Orphan before storming off. Magnus tells me that there's a temple on this island that pilgrims would come to pray at. He and Orphan both agree that there's something wrong about the island, like there not being any inhabitants. Marcus says that there may be offerings left in the temples, which has Orphan thinking he could make some money, disappointing Magnus. That's all in this room, so I go down the stairs and leave. I return to the temple entrance when a new bridge appears to another door. Cleo's there and jealous about Sethi, thinking that she has Orphan and Magnus wrapped around her little finger. Something that isn't apparent in this game is that in the source material, Cleo is Orphan's love interest. I did not get that idea at all when I played this. Cleo's cat, Lucky, who is only just appearing now after having never been mentioned, attacks an old lady hidden in the shadows. You're working for that woman, aren't you? What woman? It won't work! I won't let you get away with it! When Orphan and Cleo try to get more information from her, she runs away. They don't even try to follow her. That way it only leads to the rest house, so there's no way for her to hide. Help oh, Magnus is still there, he could catch her. They think about what she said for about two seconds before giving up. I head down to the centre of the room where I can ask any of the three travellers to join me. I don't know why though, because I need Sephi to progress and the other two have no use in the story path if I'm remembering right. So I don't know why this choice is even here. Because I remember picking Mara as a kid and getting immediately stuck. Arthur wants to keep going with Sephi just to make sure he gets paid, while also trying not to make it seem like he distrusts her. When Magnus shows up, Arthur changes his tune to him being too kind to leave her alone after everything they've been through. Sephi and Magnus buy it. All right, back together again with Sephi. Shut up, you knobhead. The group then goes through the newly available door. There are four chests just lying out in the open. I don't consider that being too easy, and of course one comes alive and starts chewing on me. I stand inside and start slashing for too long before I realise it doesn't work that close. So I make a bit of distance with almost no health left, but it still takes like ten hits to kill. And there are three left. I finally use one of those incenses I've been hoarding, only for the next one to take away all the health I healed before I've even regained control. I manage to kill it though. The other two I take out with no issue though. I walk a little and Magnus stops us to say... Alright, together again! What are you on about? It's been two minutes. Everyone moves on a little, but the floor opens beneath them and they fall. No one's hurt, but we're in a cell being watched by the old woman from earlier. When Sephi asks to be let out, the woman accuses her of putting on an act and calling her a servant of Curis. Then she demands to know what we did with her granddaughter. Of course, none of the three know what she's talking about. She doesn't believe them and leaves. Sephi is especially confused because she has never been to Chaos Island before, and when Orphan asks, she says she's never heard the name Curis either. While Sephi is in despair and Orphan is thinking, I'm now playing as Magnus. I discover that jumping on one of the blocks we are standing on will make it sink, so I keep doing it until Magnus falls through. Orphan and Sephi jump down after him, but I'm still playing as him. I press a switch to raise a block to create a bridge behind me. I follow this long path to another switch to create a bridge elsewhere. I also make sure to get the chest while looking for it. I also ignore the flies here. Because the room is dark and the paths look the same, it's a pain to figure out where I am. Eventually I reach this platform in the middle and jump on the block in the middle to make it fall through. We land in another room, overlooking the entrance to Gaia's tomb, where the old woman is seen with Cleo, although the main group don't see this. After Orphan makes fun of him for not embarrassing himself this time, we keep going down these corridors, rubbing against the walls until I find one I can push in. I'm now back in control of Orphan and have some chests to open. Nothing new though. I once again have to jump on a block repeatedly to drop down to the next area. I walk forward a bit and Magnus spots Cleo beside the old woman. 
When Arthur asks what she's thinking, she says she ran into her after we left and talked with her. Her eyesight is bad and so she thought Sethi was someone else. She says she's helping her find a granddaughter. When Arthur says she's locked them in a dungeon, Cleo thinks that's ridiculous and tells him to look for the granddaughter too. She leaves before Arthur is done talking to her. I walk down the stairs and a pair of hands come up from below and slap the ground. Arthur decides to go ahead first. You don't take much damage if you touch the hands, so really you could just ignore them and be fine. At the end I go down the stairs and across another path with another unhelpful chest halfway there. Then just repeat some more, with more chests to open until the viewers catch up and I'm put in a fight with three huggers and a man eater behind bars. They spit out gas while I'm using the bite of lightning and the sword to take them out easily. Man eater is added to the picture book. The others leave me alone to keep going down more stairs. They then catch up again for another fight with four huggers and a lizard man. Strategy is basically the same. I did so well in this fight that Magnus was added to the picture book. The other two run off again and leave me to go down more stairs. Eventually I reach the bottom and the others come back again. Don't know why they left. After the first fight there weren't any more traps. They then jump down a hole leading to the underground labyrinth. We're met with more swinging blades. Arthur makes the other's hand back again. The blades are used to get past and lead to a corridor with spike crushers. There's an emerald incense after them, then a perfume scented bag next to the switch that when jumped on opens a door. Get past some more crushers, get the first blue lantern in the game and walk past another blade. Press another switch which drops a spiked ball behind me, I run off ahead of it and get stuck walking slowly behind another spiked ball. When it reverses after hitting a wall, I get hit but it was past me and I can continue. At the end of this corridor is a fight against three man-eaters and two killer bees. There's also a darkness element hanging around. For this one, I swap the hand of Pyro back in to deal with them. You want to take out the killer bees first, they're a pain in the ass. Then use the hand of Pyro on the man-eaters. Killer bee gets out of the picture book for this fight. After the fight, I then swap back in the Vault of Thunder and swap the Bite of Lightning for the Pinnacle of the Sun. I land in another room with no traps in sight, just empty cages. So I just move through the corridors from room to room, opening all the chests until I meet back up with Magnus and Sephi, who also don't know the way out. Magnus does suggest off and try getting in one of the cages though. Before I do, I find another chest with Sephi's Dance of the Wind inside. When Orphan gets in the cage, it raises another cage in another room. Another cage has a statue inside that when pushed out, makes it rise. This lowers the middle one in that other room, making it possible for me to climb the stairs onto it. I can then stand on the three cages behind them to lower them and lift the cage blocking the stairs further down, which I take. Here I have a maze to make my way through with the wall shooting arrows at me. After roaming for a bit, I hear a scream before viewers catch up. Sephi then runs off ahead and the others follow. Sephi finds a young girl and decides to protect her, leading to a solo fight. Here there are two killer bees and a hellfire. The bees get taken out pretty quickly and as long as the hellfire doesn't block when you fire, it goes down almost as quick. Hellfire is then added to the picture book. The other two catch up while Sephi checks on the girl. She asks if the girl is looking for her grandmother. She is the missing granddaughter, Rani. Orphan asks her if she knows anyone called Curis. Rani says that Curis is an evil woman who used her for an experiment. She says the experiment makes her age faster. But... you look... you're so young. Well, I'm only ten. You're ten? Mmm, she definitely looks older than ten. Look at that body. First, no. Second, is this really a big shock? Just based on the voice and appearance, I'd have guessed around 10 or 11. This reminds me of the Faris is a woman twist in Final Fantasy V, where the real twist is that we were supposed to think otherwise. And third, no. Rani says that it's so strong she's been aging visibly every day. She just wants to see her grandmother one more time before she dies of old age. Cleo and the old woman then arrive. The old woman thinks that Rani aged naturally in the last few days until Arthur and Rani point out the truth. She promises to find a way to cure Rani. Apparently Curis is trying to figure out eternal youth. She apologised to Sethi, saying that she simply looks very similar to Curis. Spoiler, apart from them both being women, they look nothing alike. Orphan figures out that the rapid ageing is the effect of the age-halting experiment failing. The old woman tells of the crystal egg we dealt with a while back. Orphan asks if fragments will be of any use, but she says that they need the whole egg to be able to cure Rani. Legend says that the egg is hidden in the underground temple. Often takes offence to Sethi volunteering the entire group to help until Magnus reminds him of the promised reward. Cleo and the old woman, revealed to be named Jado, take Rani back while assuring her that Orphan will help out and not giving him a chance to refuse. Orphan still tries to refuse, but eventually gives in. Behind me is a set of stairs leading to the underground temple. The group lands on a balcony overlooking a giant gold temple. I run along the outside, passing these weird statues until I run into the only one with a head. I push it in the corner, creating a staircase down. Once I reach the next level down, the stairs disappear. I then look for the next statue with a head and do the same. This time there are two of them to create the next staircase. The next level has three statues to push for the next staircase to the bottom. I run around to the other side of the temple and Sephi stops me to push in a wall. Inside I have to get to the other side of this room as walls rise up close to me to make a maze. 
pressing the switch in here will reset the room. It's not too hard and you can actually jump over on the walls as they rise. At the other end I push out a block to create some stairs to the next tier of the temple. I also make sure to pick up the purple incense in here. However, I get trapped on the way out and have to reset the room again, also having to push the block out again. I make it out this time and lead Orphan and Magnus back to the side I started in front of and climb up onto the second tier. The opposite side to this one has a hole so they can fit into. In this next room I jump on the ledge next to where I started and push out a boulder to make a wall rise below it. I run around the corner to make another rise below me, showing me another block on a higher up ledge. I push the first block in this gap then get behind the other to push it below a hole on the other side. This leads outside and gets me to the top tier of a temple before Orphan and Magnus catch up. They're certain that they're in front of the treasure chamber but don't know how to get in. Sethi recites a spell that reveals the wall to be fake and everyone walks through. While Orphan gawks all the treasure, Sethi finds the crystal egg. Touching it activates three gold skeletons, putting me in a fight. There is to destroy but they don't stay gone long before reforming. Behind them is a statue but I can only attack it when they're out of the way. It can be a pain, especially when you're running at the statue to use a sword but the skeleton reforms just before you can pass it. But it doesn't take that long and I get them killed when I defeat the statue. The spell I get for winning this fight is the Hail of Heavens, an ice elemental spell. Oh, I don't know how to thank you enough. Now, just give me the egg and we can go back. And just what do you want with the egg, Sephi? Oh, well, I, uh... You came to this island to pray for your dead fiancé, right? Well then, you shouldn't need the egg for that. So perhaps now is a good time to change your cover story. But Sephi doesn't get the chance before an explosion knocks them all down, knocking the crystal egg out of Orphan's hands. A woman teleports in and grabs it. This is Curious. She thanks Orphan for breaking the scene on the temple and defeating the guards. She gives them one chance to leave the island with their lives. But Sephi tries to take it back, leading to Orphan having to stop her from getting killed with the shield of immunity and then knocking Curious down with the hand of Pyro. Curious drops the egg and it shatters. While Sephi's in despair, Curious calls them fools and teleports out. While Sephi's muttering about being so close, Orphan asks why she really came to the island. She admits that she came to Chaos Island, hoping to use the Crystal Egg to bring Rufus back to life. Everyone returns to Gaia's tomb. Sephi apologises to the others for lying to them. She taught herself to fight before coming to Chaos Island, but still wasn't confident she'd get far alone. She knew the temple would be especially hard, so she admits to using Orphan and Magnus. She knew Orphan would be useful after seeing his pendant, which is basically the mark of the powerful sorcerer in the actual series, I think. Orphan asks how she found out about the egg. Sephi says she could never get over Rufus's death and reread his letters to her constantly, and the last time she spoke to him in person was right before he set off to find the crystal egg. His final letter to her said that he found out the egg had the power to resurrect the dead. When Magnus says that just isn't possible, Sephi finally breaks down and cries. She walks off and Magnus follows. I then return to the rest house. First I talk to Cleo, who, with no one having filled her in on Sephi's story, tries to tease Orphan by assuming Sephi is in love with Magnus and that it makes Orphan jealous. Orphan tells her to shut up and mind her own business, so she storms off. Zeus simply asks if Sephi is having troubles and when Orphan says she is, he just goes, thought so, bye, and leaves. He just found new information on his daughter. Ma plays a melody on his flute and asks Orphan if he's ever heard it anywhere. Orphan says no and Ma says that he heard it can be heard on this island before he leaves too. I finally check in on Sephi and Magnus. Magnus still can't believe how close they were, but Orphan reminds him that even with it, sorcery can't bring back the dead. Magnus somehow takes that to mean that Orphan thinks Sephi should just move on and forget Rufus. Sephi apologises for crying in front of Orphan, while Orphan just asks what she's going to do now. She says that she doesn't know and walks out. With everyone spoken to, I return to the tomb entrance. Another bridge appears, leading to another door. I walk back down to Sephi and invite her to rejoin the party. Magnus catches up and has an idea. He brings up using the crystal egg shards back in the Tower of Mercy to travel back to before the egg was broken. Orphan says they don't have any other options, so I go through the newly available door. Right away we're faced with another puzzle room and Sephi takes over. I have three minutes to push these blocks to make a path to the exit. There's a chest in here with a herb which fully restores your health. Much better than the other chest containing an emerald lantern. Three minutes is plenty of time to reach the other side, I'm just taking so long picking up the chests. I get there with 59 seconds left. Sephi whips through the doors to hit a switch to open them. This leads back to the Tower of Mercy, the final area of this story path. We start having already reached the egg fragments. Sephi uses the four shards there to send us back in time again. In this past version of the tower, it's incredibly hot. It's a desert outside. More importantly, the unbroken crystal egg is right there. Arvin spots the skeletons around their feet and tries to stop Sephi from grabbing it, but it's too late. They end up trapped in the middle of the room and need to rely on Magnus to get them out. Magnus complains about having to be the one to look for a switch, but Arthur tells him to stop whining. I take the lift down to the next floor and do the same again. These are the same traps as when I was through here earlier, but backwards and the chests are full again. 
First the cogs, then the pillars, the spiked floor, then I'm at the bottom. There are four snake statues with switches on, and Magnus doesn't know which is the right one, so he decides to hit them all. Get the chest in the middle and hit all the switches. The floor beneath Magnus breaks away and falls, then the room starts filling with sand. Magnus then sinks into the middle. Meanwhile, Orphan and Sethi are free, and Orphan claims credit for the one thing Magnus didn't fuck up. They wait, and when Magnus still isn't back after a while, Orphan takes back his compliments. Orphan goes on alone to look for him. I go down the lift to see a group of enemies waiting for me. Sethi shows up again and the fight starts. This one has three lizard men and two hellfires along with a couple lamps on the ceiling to drop on them. I reset the fight halfway through when I realise that swapping out Pinnacle of the Sun for Hail of Heavens will be much more effective against these fire monsters. The fight goes smoothly after that, I get my first duplicate for the picture book with another Magnus, but at that point I still think I have the chance of getting all the entries, so I restart the game to try getting a different result. Magnus again. I give in and just move on. As does Orphan after the fight, leaving Sefi behind. Once again I have to repeat the same flaws I just put Magnus through. It does give me the chance to pick up a couple chests I missed as Magnus though, so I don't mind. Two of them were even purple lanterns. Orphan reaches the bottom floor filling with sand. He looks around for a bit before another fight starts. Here there are a couple killer bees and a landos hanging around below the sand. Taking that out just took me spamming Hail of Heavens after everything else was dead. Another duplicate to the picture book with another killer bee. When I'm back in control, I open the one chest in here and head to the exit in the back of the room where Sethi catches up again. After they speculate on what happened to Magnus, Orphan finally notices that big exit right next to him and points it out. In the next room, a pair of sandworms come out of the ground, leading to Sephi fighting them alone. There's also a single killer bee here. The sandworms are easy to deal with, just wait until they come out from the sand and start whipping or spellcasting. This time, Sephi is added to the picture book. We're back in control of Orphan and on a bridge. I run to the other side just to have Sephi shout for Magnus before climbing down this ladder in the middle. I ignore looking for Magnus and loot all the chests down here. There's nothing new. Then I find Magnus passed out face first in the sand. He's fine though. Just before they can set off again, we get attacked by a pair of sandworms along with a couple killer bees and a beholder. I take a lot of damage, but there are healing elements in this fight so it isn't too hard. It takes a while waiting for the sandworms to surface though. Once again, I just get killer bee for the picture book. After the fight, I climb back up the ladder and head through the exit on the other side of the bridge. Magnus declares everything over and happy and another minor argument breaks out with Orphan over whether or not he's easy to get along with. Sephi just finds it funny and uses the crystal egg to return to the present. Before they head off back, Orphan senses someone's presence and demands that they show themselves. An old man hobbles over to them out of the shadows. When Orphan asks who the old man is, he instead asks Sephi why she came here. Sephi realises right away that this old man is Rufus. Understandably shocked to find her dead fiancé being not dead and also really old now causes Sephi to faint and drop the crystal egg. The egg rolls off where Curious swoops in and snatches it. It's obvious that Curious is behind what happened to Rufus and Orphan demands answers. Curious says she made a deal with Rufus who wanted to see the power of the crystal egg. He's another victim of Curious's experiments to attain eternal youth, like Rani. And like Rani, the experiment failed. But now she has the entire egg, she thinks she can now finally stop her aging. Arthur isn't letting that happen though. When Sethi wakes up and asks how Rufus could help her, he begs forgiveness for letting his curiosity win over his common sense. He regrets letting Curious fool him, but more than that, he regrets spending those years searching for the crystal egg rather than spending them with Sethi. But Sephi says that she also believed in Rufus's dreams and that she still loves him and doesn't regret anything. Curious mocks their reunion and the short time they'll have left. Rufus begs her to spare them as she promised him she would if she got the egg. Surprise, she was lying. She says that nothing can stop her now. You're deluded, Curious. No one lives forever, as you're about to find out. Die, witch! Time for the final boss of Sephi's story. Golnaf is an almost complete reskin of the Garriga that I fought back on the boat. Yeah, Sephi's route ends with a copy-paste of the game's second boss. I'm just jumping from falling rocks rather than masts. In fact, it's even easier since it's always in view rather than going underwater and making me wait for it. That's a shame. It also leaves me with nothing else to talk about as I spam Bolt of Thunder until it dies. For defeating this boss, I gain the Shield of Inferno that, as the name implies, reflects fire attacks. Side note, Rufus and the new spell narrator are both voiced by Paul Eiding and sound the same. He's only credited as Rufus, so is Rufus supposed to be the one explaining new spells to me? Curious runs away, leaving the egg. Rufus once again apologises to Sephi. He sent out a false report of his death once Curious aged him, as he couldn't bear for Sephi to see what had happened to him. They return to Gaia's tomb to find Rani laid out on the floor. For some reason, she took a bad turn. Magnus hands over the crystal egg to Jado, but she doesn't know how to use it. Jado is ready to give in with the small comfort that she herself probably doesn't have long left and will be reunited with Rani soon. But Rufus comes in and says that he can break the spell, as he knows more about the egg than anyone else. He tells everyone to step back, tells Sephi he's glad he got to see her one more time, and recites a spell. Rani is cured, but Rufus is dying. He thanks Sephi for coming to the island, but says that it's his time. 
Magnus tries to get off and help, but there's nothing he can do. Sephi figures out that Rufus could have saved himself with the egg, but knew it can only be used once before shattering. They exchange their last words, and Rufus once again voices his regret for not spending his life with Sephi before he passes. Rani wonders why he saved her instead of himself, as the screen fades out and Sephi's crying. We then cut to a new boat with some nice happy ending music. Arthur, Magnus and Cleo reflect on their journey, with Cleo once again teasing Arthur for a supposed attraction to Sephi that he never had but she won't let go. Sephi decided to stay and live on Chaos Island to watch over Rufus's grave for the rest of her life. She kept her word on paying Arthur. Magnus doesn't get it because he basically thinks she's too hot to live on a deserted island. Cleo says he's too young and immature to understand, but when he says he's only three years younger than Cleo, it kicks off another argument about male versus female maturity. I did not miss their dynamic. Arthur then looks back as the screen turns white. Long have I waited for your coming. Forever imprisoned here by the chains of eternity. Unfortunately, there is little I can do, except wait. You have done well, Orphan. Very well. But your true destiny still awaits before you, unfulfilled. Here I will remain, waiting. The stage has been set for you to return. Orphan, you are my only hope. Well, that's curious. And that was Sephi's route. It was fine. The time-shifting environments at the beginning are fine, but the later areas aren't that memorable. The main plot with Jado, Rani and Curious isn't that interesting, but Sephi at least manages to be a likeable character. After saving, I'm given the option to play again to fulfil my destiny. When I choose yes, often finds himself back on the sinking boat with a feeling of deja vu. When a bee attacks him and he loses his train of thought and goes looking for Magnus and Cleo. When I regain control, I go to this chest in the corner and open it for the Sword of Justice. It's a fire elemental upgrade for the Sword of the Fallen Devil. I equip that right away. I drop down and speak to Magnus, who, without Sephi around, is now cowering and saying he can hear a spooky flute. Oh well. I ignore it and instead check on Cleo, who introduces often to Zeus, and everyone acts as if they've never met. All I learn about him is that he's a mercenary before I allow him to join the group. Then the Garriga attacks and I have to fight it again. No change to the fight and I win again and have to watch the boat sink again. Often wakes up to Cleo yelling at him. He's once again informed that they've landed on Chaos Island and that they were on the wrong boat. At this point he seems to have lost his memory of Sephi's story since he reacts with shock. No one's seen Magnus either. We're swapping him out for Cleo in this story path. Zeus says that he was heading to Chaos Island to look for his daughter, around the same age as Cleo. Ten years earlier his wife left him and took his daughter with her. He heard that his wife died recently and that his daughter is living alone on Chaos Island, but now Zeus isn't sure if coming was the right idea, he doesn't know if she'll recognise him after so long. Cleo is certain that she'll be happy to see him though. Zeus doesn't know where specifically she lives and was expecting the island to be a lot smaller. Cleo volunteers herself and Orphan to help him. Orphan argues but gives in, saying that they need Zeus's strength in case there are more monsters. But he states that they only intend to leave the island, finding Zeus's daughter on the way would just be a bonus. After getting control, I managed to take just a few steps before Cleo stops me to point something out. There's a glowing platform on the other end of this area. There's also flies to deal with. The first chest I find in this area contains the bow of ice for Zeus. The rest of the chests contain the same consumables we've had before. I make my way to the portal and jump on. It sticks me in a room with a lot of bookshelves. It's also a proper dark in here. I love the brightness like a golden eye or hulk, but this wasn't a recording issue. The game was that dark for me. More consumables to get from chests and one lone book to examine. Cleo complains about us having hit a dead end. While thinking of what to do next, Orphan learns of the crystal egg, again, in the lone book. Same legend, on the island, move through time, all that. When Zeus says he hasn't heard of it, Orphan says he hasn't either. Eventually, Zeus starts pushing a bookshelf out of the way. Moving along the path he created, Orphan finds another book about someone called Gaia who tried to learn of the human existence. We've heard the name Gaia with Gaia's tomb where most of the damn time was in Sephi's story. Zeus finds a book informing the party that they are in the Tower of Wisdom and that there's a passage from here leading underground. Zeus tells the others to wait and jumps into the portal behind the bookshelf alone. This puts him in a fight with two lizard men and a man-eater. Zeus has his sword to melee attacks and his projectile attack uses a bow. Rather than elemental spells, Zeus swings a large mace. Maybe it's bad starting equipment for this fight, but Zeus doesn't seem to deal much damage, leading to the fight dragging on for a while. For this fight, I get Lizard Man for the picture book again. Everyone moves on to the next room. Cleo sees some writing on the wall saying, We are the guardians of wisdom. If you we spy, here your bones will lie. We are stones possessed of wisdom. She doesn't get it and lets often work it out. This floor is a maze with stone pillars blocking certain paths. If you get in their sights, they will block your progress. Somehow I got to the end with no trouble at all. My last memory of this game before playing it again was being a kid getting stuck in this room for ages before giving up. I don't know how I got through it so easily. 
On the other end of the portal, there's a group of monsters waiting. Arthur blames Cleo for being the first one through the portal. Zeus stops them before they can start a real argument and reminds them that it's time to fight. Here we have two Groks and three lizard men. Arthur's spells are far more useful than Zeus's weapons and they go down much quicker than the last fight. Duplicate Grok. On the next floor, Cleo points out what she believes looks like a giant roulette wheel. By examining the statue in the middle, the three platforms start spinning. First I'd line them up to get the two chests on this floor, then I'd line them up to reach the next portal. Often says that this floor should have been another library, but it's all flooded, removing travelling underground as an option. Often asks where Zeus's daughter lives, and he says that if she isn't here then maybe somewhere in the centre of the island. Cleo thinks she's spotted an exit so she takes over. I have to make my way across these crates and barrels in the water to get to the other side. There's also two more chests in here. On the other side, Cleo finds a chain and uses it to open the door. After a bragging, everyone moves on. The exit leads to a ship graveyard. Zeus wonders how a ship graveyard even happened here, even though he himself went upon the island from a shipwreck. No one wants to go through this place, but it's the only way. And the drawbridge behind them fucks off too, so they really have no choice now. I get on the first ship, climb up the mast and jump over to the next ship. Holes break open in the floor on my way to the chest. I then drop down and get the chest inside. Once again, there's nothing new in them. I climb to the top of this mast and drop down to a bit of debris next to the ship. Then I jump across some more to reach another ship. When I reach said ship, I end up in a fight with three sea pigs and some knife fish. There are a couple electric elements to use here as well. The Sword of Justice also chews through sea pig health. But when I kill everything, more appear. Zeus tells Orphan to hold them off while he creates a path forward. This part is simple, it's just some knife fish which are destroyed by the ball of thunder. After spending a couple of minutes pushing on the boat, Zeus then just kicks a big hole in it. From the hull I head to the other side of the ship, run through a cabin and up and back outside. On the other end here is the ship's treasure room. Orphan and Cleo are thrilled until a skeleton appears and makes the floor beneath them collapse. I get dropped into a battle with a beholder, a killer bee and a group of bats, Votoru. There's a much appreciated healing element in the corner because I get hit a lot just from the volume of enemies. Once again Zeus leads him to Orphan as he starts trying to make another way out. A bit later he kicks another hole in the wall to escape through. When Cleo demands to know how to get to the next ship, Zeus goes to look for a solution alone. Even he's probably getting sick of Cleo yelling every single line of dialogue. There's one more chest here before I use Zeus's sword to knock down the mast to create a bridge to the next ship. This ship is the final one before I jump off next to a set of stairs. There's two more chests to open before I start climbing the stairs. Everyone stops to look at the last ship and only often recognises it as the ship they were on. But Zeus points out that the ship looks hundreds of years old. It doesn't take long for often to work out that they're in the future. But because he can't remember the last story, he can't work out how. Going up the next set of stairs leads to another aerial pathway. Oh, this just looks beautiful. Zeus sees a figure run by and he gives chase. He thought it was his daughter, but then he guesses he was seeing things. Cleo points out a grave I can barely make out even with the camera pointed at it, it's so dark. I then head down the stairs where we can see Curis. Zeus believes that this is his daughter, Azel. But she disappears when Zeus chases her again to this tomb. The tomb has Azel's name on it. It can't be. He doesn't sound that upset about it. I often see something inside the tomb and ask if it belonged to Azel, but Zeus can't make it out. I run around opening the chests, getting the hammer of rending for Zeus. Some involve moving gravestones to reach them. I go down some stairs off to the side and push another grave, revealing a hole I can drop down. Amazing that something completely underground with no light is lighter than the previous area. This tunnel leads inside Azel's tomb, which is also more well lit than the area outside it. Often finds a pendant and a broken piece of the crystal egg, although once again, he doesn't recognise it. There's also a letter from Azel addressed to Zeus. It states her hope that Zeus will find his way here one day. It's also part of a diary that confirms a broken piece to be from the crystal egg and that it can be activated by touching the inside of the shell. Cleo reaches the conclusion that the ghost they saw was Azel leading Zeus to the crystal egg fragment. Often reminds them both that they're just trying to escape the island, leading to his 84th argument with Cleo over him being insensitive. Zeus sides with Orphan though, saying they should use the egg to return to their own time. So they do. Return to a better lit and emptier version of the graveyard. More importantly for Zeus, Azel's tomb doesn't exist, giving hope that she's still alive. I head back up the stairs into a new area I couldn't reach before, run through a couple of rooms of crumbling floors until I reach some more stairs going up. This is followed by more crumbling floors and some wooden barricades to break through. Get the two not very useful chests and move through the next corridor while avoiding a crushing. The first time anyway. I get squashed the second time which does very little damage actually. At the end is a fight with some groks and votoroos. Nothing interesting to say, even the arena was already used in Seth's story. This fight gets me votoroo for the picture book. I go up the stairs some more, where Cleo points out Gaia's tomb in the distance. We should go check it out. Yeah. Could sound a little more enthusiastic, Zeus. Up the stairs and in the cave at the top, there's a lot of spider webs, and Cleo gets a foot caught in one half her own size. Often downplays it, but I'm on Cleo's side for once. Fuck that shit. 
The cave shakes and two huge tentacles emerge from deeper in the cave. Often has Zeus keep Cleo safe while he deals with it alone. These two are called Jigeos. They spit out eggs that release swarms of spiders, but the bite of lightning wipes them out in one. As for the Jigeos themselves, I keep using the Bolt of Thunder on them. The first one goes down quick, which halves the birth rate of little spiders, meaning the second is defeated even quicker. When both Jigeos are gone, the source of the spider webs, Xandor, appears. It can create a web to defend itself, but the Bolt of Thunder sorts that out, leaving me free to cut it up with the Sword of Justice. Its projectile attacks can inflict a form of poison that prevents me from using my shield. However, you know that strategy I just mentioned? It took me a little too long to figure it out, and I end up dying with Xandor itself being nearly dead. I get reloaded back in the graveyard too, since that was the last chance I was given to save. Ten minutes later, I'm back fighting Xandor and get killed again. And the third time. Fourth too. By my fifth death, I'm doing worse than ever. I think I must have gotten frustrated from only getting one attempt every ten minutes and started ignoring strategy altogether. At this time I took a little break, and on my sixth attempt, I'm doing better than ever. It even starts to do a new attack, firing a huge fireball out of its sack. Its normal projectiles also start coming out really quick. You have to shield before they're even out to block them. But this is the time I kill it. Six attempts taking an hour altogether made me remember just how bad some games could get with their sparse save points and dying requiring a reload. Most of the time I don't mind it, but this situation was an exception. The spell gained for this boss is the Armor of Purity, which reflects darkness attacks. Also, the Armor of Purity reflects darkness attacks back to all enemies. I love these. For some reason, Mr. Riding sounds very confused listing the elements for each shield. Afterwards, everyone is outside resting at a campfire. Zeus thinks out loud that his daughter is gone and that he's too late. Arthur complains about Zeus's depression ruining his meal, getting him a shouting it from Cleo. Both of them remind Zeus that they don't know for certain that the grave they saw was hers, and even if it was, it was only in the future. After this little talk, they arrive at Gaia's hidden room. As soon as they arrive, they hear an old woman scream. The camera moves on ahead to show Curious and Jado in a struggle before Curious tells Jado to let go of her and knocks her over. Jado demands that she gives something back to her just as the main group arrives to check on her. She tells him not to worry about her and just get the crystal egg back. Zeus tries to chase Curious but she runs off and collapses a corridor between them. Jado introduces herself to the group and recognises Zeus as Azel's father. She brings him to the tomb before Zeus asks for answers. Jado says that Azel and her mother told her about Zeus often. When Zeus asks where she is, Jado says that Curious kidnapped her in the name of science. Jado says that Curious hides in the underground tunnels, but her magic prevents anyone else but her from entering. Cleo suggests using the basement of the Tower of Wisdom, but often shoots it down, saying that they need another way. After Cleo and Jado head off to the rest house, Magnus shows up again and introduces himself to Zeus. Often kicks him from behind, then complains about Magnus not being happy enough to see him again. After this, the room is empty, so it's time to head to the rest house myself. First I go up the stairs and talk to Magnus. Magnus tells Orphan that there are three towers on the island. Orphan says he knows because Magnus has already been to the Tower of Mercy, but Magnus says he hasn't, which leads to a lot of confusion. I've only done Cephy's route first each time I've played this game, so I wonder if that changed the dialogue and picking Zeus's story first would change it. Speaking of Cephy, she's nearby. Nothing new, just that she made it here with Magnus, as you'd expect. Mar is in a worse mood than last time. He hates the rest house for it reminding him of an orphanage he used to live in. Orphan relates because he is also an orphan. Cleo's feeling down because they let Curious escape. Zeus is trying to think of a way to reach Curious before Orphan reminds him of the book in the Tower of Wisdom that told of underground tunnels linking the entire island together. That reminder perked him up a bit, and he leaves the rest house to prepare for the journey. Sephi asks if Zeus is a mercenary, saying that she'd feel safe with someone like him travelling with her before leaving herself. That girl you were just talking to? Yeah. Do you think she could be my sister? <laughs> what the hell, kid? Last time you wanted to be a mother and now this? With Ma leaving, Cleo and Magnus don't have anything else to say, so I follow. Just like the last playthrough, a bridge opens to a new door in the entrance room before I ask Zeus to rejoin. Before they can decide on a plan to reach the tunnels, Magnus catches up with them. Cleo's too tired and stressed out from the journey here, so Magnus decided to help them out for a bit, declaring himself more useful. He says that he also met someone who should be able to help them out. He takes him to meet Rani, who knows Chaos Island completely. Often says she's just a kid, which, combined with her using the exact same character model as in Sephi's story, it was me right about that whole mess with people mistaking her for an adult. After introductions where Rani gets Orphan's name wrong and Magnus doesn't actually know Zeus's name to give it, Zeus tells Rani he's looking for his daughter and that she should be around Rani's age. Orphan asks if she knows how to get to the underground tunnels. She says she can take them near them. She leads them to the boat to the pathway. Rani rows the boat excruciatingly slowly, which makes sense. She's only like 10 and has Zeus's weight right at the front. Couldn't he take over and she just direct him? Magnus asks why she lives alone on the island. 
Rani says that her job is to look after the graves on the island as both of her parents are buried here. In this version of the events, Rani and Jado are not related. So you two are alone. <gasps> where? Where did you find that? Huh? Oh, this. It belongs to my daughter. Her name is Azel. Do you know her? Azel? You know her? No. I, uh... I just asked because it's so pretty. I see. Sorry. Hmm. Anyway, the bow stops at a gate that won't open. Arthur gets out alone to look for a lever. I jump across these cogs to find it. Who even put it here? Then the gate after is rusted shut, so Zeus goes off to sort it out. I jump on over to this block to push it in to raise the water level. On the way I get attacked by some knife fish and a pair of sea pigs. Not much to do other than spam arrows. One boring fight later and I get knife fish at it again. Afterwards I get the one chest here and pushing the block. Somehow that one block in this huge body of water that you can't even see the end of was enough. Once again the next gate is shut so off often goes again. This lever is just as out of the way as the last, jumping over more cogs. Opening this gate sets off another battle. I have to shoot these cog wheels while dealing with knife fish and irus. Once I've hit them enough and killed the enemies, I get knife fish again for the picture book. I wish I could actually see my battle performance and what it actually takes into consideration. After this fight we reach the end and can enter the Tower of Mercy. Rani sets off home but not before telling Zeus he hopes he finds his daughter. First thing I do in here is run through the chests, one of them having a great sword to Zeus. I have an exit near the top which leads to a maze. Some maze? It's just a straight line. We get attacked by monsters but for some reason Zeus decides that this battle is personal and does it alone. Thanks Zeus for making me play as your slow ass and making the fight longer than it should be. Thanks to Zeus's speed, Sephi is the more enjoyable character to play as for me. It's two groks and four killer bees. I'm restarting the fight constantly in the hopes of getting Zeus added to the picture book for doing well. By the time I let myself win, it was all for nothing because I got Grok again. I then run across to the other side of this one way maze to reach the Tower of Wisdom. Not much to do here, I run down the ramp to reach a laboratory. Zeus reaches the conclusion that it belongs to Curious. Often finds the one book between the three bookshelves. It's a logbook chronicling the time based experiments done in this lab. It mentions using two young girls as test subjects, but one escaped. No mentioning of Azel by name though. In the centre of the room I find a secret entrance to the underground labyrinth. Often sees the traps in front and decides it's too dangerous for the others, so he goes on ahead. I have to run through the tunnel, avoiding getting hit by the spiky balls. I turn a corner and make my way across this floor, avoiding crushes and moving walls wanting to push me into lava. It's not too bad. In the next tunnel I stop at what I think is a fork only to be hit by a swinging blade. I don't fall for that again as I avoid the next three. There's a purple lantern at the end though to undo the damage. I avoid one more spiked ball in the tunnel before Magnus and Zeus catch up. In the next room, Arthur nearly gets hit by another ball and so Zeus offers to go alone to look for a switch to turn off the traps. I run up the slope, hiding in the holes off to the side from the balls, getting the healing items on the way. At the end I stand on a switch to block off the balls. I still have another to climb though. It goes the same as the first. As does the third, just with better healing items in the chests. At the end of this one, the others catch up. I move into the next room where Zeus had to do it all again. But here there's a wider room with multiple balls to dodge. I even get killed here trying to get all the chests. I get them all next time and press the switches near the top, blocking off more balls and opening a door. Arthur and Magnus catch up and Magnus points out Curious. Zeus chases after her. Curious tells him to tell their master Jado that she'll never give back the crystal egg. She runs and Zeus chases again. They have a cornered but the floor opens up beneath them. While Arthur tries to get Zeus to calm down, another Magnus has appeared. Arthur decides beating them both up will reveal which is fake. But during this, one disappeared and a second Zeus appears. So Orphan beats them up too. But now there's two Orphans, giving Zeus and Magnus their chance to pay back. This knocks all the colour out of the fake for some reason. Now we get to fight the doppelganger. It casts a spell I don't have yet before morphing into Zeus. Attacking the doppelganger in this state also damages Zeus. While I'm running up at it, he turns into a full colour version of Orphan. Hitting him once like this makes Orphan drop dead, and makes me have to deal with the spiked balls again. The best thing to do is never attack him when in the form of the party, and use the armour of purity to reflect his darkness spell back. He can also transform into other enemies, which leaves you free to attack. But once again, he turns into Orphan as I'm running up to slash him and get insta-killed. It's not until my fourth attempt I manage to kill him by slashing him in the form of a lizard man. For winning, I get the spell he was using against me, the Smoke of Pain. Everyone then returns to Gaia's tomb. Magnus wonders where Cleo is for about a second before Cleo shows up from behind to hit him. Turns out she isn't happy that they went off without her and left her to wait in the rest house. Magnus only thought she was tired. She asks how everything went and is given the bad news. Often says that all they can do now is sit down and plan their next move. 
Zeus can't stay calm, however, and runs off screaming into another room. But then in the animated cutscene, he's behind the party, glowing red and demanding the heir to give his daughter back before running off again, shouting Curious's name. Then a load of lasers come out of the wall and get blocked by Orphan Shield. Orphan reminds Zeus why he needs to keep calm. I don't know, this scene is kind of weird. I wonder if it was animated based on an earlier draft or something because it just feels out of place. Even afterwards, they're just heading back to the rest house as if nothing happened. Even when I talk to Cleo first thing, she's just telling off and off for not getting anything done. Magnus wants to cheer Zeus up but doesn't know what to say. Sephi says that angry Zeus scares her and she leaves, and Ma just asks why everyone's upset and leaves when Orphan doesn't explain. Zeus loses his cool again and walks out, so I follow. Another door opens, I ask Zeus to rejoin again. Cleo isn't letting them go without her this time. Magnus is being left behind this time because Cleo thinks he's useless. Well, based on just this game, she's not wrong. Rani then shows up to ask how things went. Rani wants to come with them to the Tower of Wisdom. She leaves with them only for... Hey Rani, you should go home now. Oh. That's all. Why did she even come? When we get to the tower, we see Curious sinking into quicksand as the group arrives. Of course, the chest with consumables I'm not going to use come first. Then I allow myself to sink after her, triggering a battle with a few killer bees and sandworms. Once again, I get killer bee after winning. After that, I sink to the next level, where I'm getting attacked by sandworms out of battle. The flow of sand is so strong in this room that I have to jump to move forward. After getting lost for a bit, I end up finding the sinkhole to the next level. Down there is this huge, unmoving monster. It's got these four pulsating bits on each side that take a few sword slashes to destroy. For some reason, this makes it sink too, dragging off and down with it. On the next floor, it's another battle with more killer bees and a couple landos. Once again, I get fucking killer bees for the picture book. The next floor has platforms made of sand forming that I have to jump across to get to the other side of the room. From there, I drop down in front of Curious, who has the crystal egg with her. Orphan and Zeus prepare to kill her, when Rani, who didn't actually leave, stands in their way. You can't! Zeus, this lady isn't... Curious, she isn't... I mean, she's Azel. She's your daughter, Azel. Rani apologises to Azel, and tells her that the man in front of her is her father. Azel and Rani were both kidnapped and used in experiments. Rani was chosen to be the first test subject, but Azel saved her and took her place. Azel was aged seven times faster than a normal person, like Rani supposedly was in Sethi's story, due to the experiment failing. Rani blames herself for not escaping and not saving Azel. She never told anyone because of the guilt she felt over it. Before Zeus and Azel can have a proper reunion, Cleo asks who Jado is then. The tower starts shaking and Jado reveals herself, having taken back the crystal egg. You've probably figured out by now that Jado was the sorceress performing time experiments this time. This game was the first time I'd ever seen a game do this with character personalities and backstories being so different depending on which character's story you were following. Back then, having Jado revealed as the true villain this time after seeing Sephi's story blew my mind. Orphan and Zeus prepare to make her give back the egg, but Jado says that if she can't have her youth back, she's taking out the entire island. She runs and everyone just watches. Cleo points and says she's getting away, but they still stop and talk first. Azel says she's headed for the volcano. If Jado drops the crystal egg into the volcano, it will sink the entire island. Said Volcano's already looking a bit over-eager and he hasn't even got the egg yet. We arrive at the Volcano and Cleo points out Jado. Orphan is just impressed at how fast the old lady can run. Running forward eventually kicks off a battle with two Votaru and two of a new enemy, Dex. They have the most health of any enemy in the game, but a free hit uncharged combo from the Sword of Justice takes out nearly half their health. The Votarus are a bit annoying in this fight because of the slow speed of the Smoke of Pain. They make me fall badly enough to get the Votaru again for the picture book. No Dex for me. I keep on moving until I reach a series of bridges over the lava. Halfway up, fireballs destroy the bridge, separating Orphan from the others. Cleo yells at him to hurry and get up there, which leads to another argument where Cleo says he'll have to take the long way around. While taking the long way, I have to avoid the fireballs raining down. There's also boulders just rolling by too. It's only about a minute long before I loop around and meet up with the other two. I then move on to the final area of Zeus's story, the mountain summit. Zeus spots Jado further on, but first a fight. A Hellfire, two decks and a Beholder. I don't know what I did that was so good for this battle, but I got Orphan for the picture book. We can't quite get to Jado yet, so I have to play as Zeus and knock down the pillars with his sword to make a bridge. While I'm doing this, I get the last three chests. When I make the bridge to the steps at the end, Cleo and Orphan catch up and they corner Jado. She's not giving in yet and summons the final boss of this chapter, a giant octopus named Zelton. Jado is then killed by the lava wave caused by Zelton emerging. Cleo can't make it on top, so it's just Orphan and Zeus. He starts by trying to flatter me with his tentacles. The main target in the middle also isn't taking damage right away. After a while, Orphan complains about the shell being too thick. Zeus gets up and cuts the shell open. That's when I start throwing out all the smokes of pain. 
Zeltan also start dropping molten rocks on me. Some of these tentacles also start throwing huge lasers at me, but I take too much damage and restart the fight, not wanting to die and deal with cutting down the pillars again. On the second attempt, I'm also mixing in the Sword of Justice and timing my shield better. I tend to fire for a projectile and while it's slowly homing in, run up and slash. When it's half slow enough, Zeus, who still has his sword in the shell, tells Orphan to finish it off. Cleo yells at him not to because that will kill Zeus too. Zeus is prepared to die to keep Azel safe, but Orphan tells Cleo to trust him. When I finally get that last hit in, I'm awarded the Falcon of Death, a wind elemental spell. Zeltan starts sinking back into the volcano. Zeus managed to get to safety on the other end of the lava. The party returns to Gaia's tomb with the crystal egg and inform the others of Jado's death. Like Rani last time, Azel is dying. She started aging even faster. Cleo gives Rani the crystal egg and she tries to use the same words Rufus used to save Rani. It works and the egg saves Azel, returning her to her true age. Zeus doesn't know what to say until Cleo gives him the words and he apologises to Azel for not being there before. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Meh, it's alright, I won't go that far. Zeus finally gets to hold his daughter as we fade back to the boat leaving the island once again. Falcon and Dorton finally make their appearance in this route complaining about being left behind. Often gives them a beating. Often recalls his final talk with Zeus. He was so grateful he gave Orphan a family heirloom, a golden arrow. Then he looks behind himself as the screen fades again. Orphan ends up in the same place as last time as Rani repeats the same speech she gave him last time. Zeus's chapter is okay. It's probably my least favourite of the three though. Zeus isn't as likeable as Sephi to me and he doesn't have that hidden motivation she did to make things a little more interesting. I mean, Dad wanting to find his missing daughter is a fine character type, but Zeus is no Harry Mason. I think he also has the weakest vocal performance of the main cast. I'd actually say he was enhanced for me back then by playing Sephis first for the surprise of the curious Jado role swap. But what happens if I say no to playing again to fulfil my destiny? I get texts saying that Orphan and crew went home, never finding out the truth of Chaos Island before the credits roll. All I have to do is reload the save to get the choice again. Once again Orphan is back on the sinking boat. He's aware hell? this is the second time this has happened now. I drop down and go to the other end to talk with Magnus and Cleo. Cleo asks which way I went in that corridor her and Magnus were arguing about all the way back at the beginning. Magnus is happy when Orphan says right. At this point I'd forgotten if that's what I even did. Cleo calls him a traitor for picking Magnus aside. Ugh, you two are impossible. I'm leaving. Good choice. Best idea he's had so far. Sad thing is, we're still on the sinking boat so there's no way to leave too. Then the Garriga attacks again. Once again there's no change. So for this third story path, you don't have to beat the other two. If you talk to both Sephi and Zeus and turn them both down, you'll start with Mars story. By the way, the Falcon of Death makes the Garriga fight go much quicker. Boat sinks one more time. I get a cutscene showing Rani touching some sort of machine, only for its arm to fall off and fade away while she hugs it and cries. We then see even more in front of her. Wake up! Get up! Can you imagine a worse thing to wake up to? Just Cleo is with Orphan this time. No Magnus, no third character for now. This time Cleo found out about it being the wrong ship from Dartin before the ship sank. Orphan isn't happy. I guess the ship sinking made him forget the other two stories again. He also doesn't care about Vulcan and Dartin, but says they should look for Magnus. The whole time this is going on, we can hear a flute playing. Cleo finally notices it. They can see Mar on a cliff much higher. When I gain control, there's a door in the mountain that Cleo can't open. She tries so hard that she pulls the handle off. Often points out that she probably just needed to push, but now they can't open it at all. So Cleo runs off alone to see if there's another way in. I run up the stairs, across a tree, climb the vines, jump off to some more stairs and open the chest containing the symbols of fire. We're already getting new equipment for Mar before he's even joined. I climb some more vines next to the chest and end up stepping on a piece of the crystal egg. This transports Cleo to sunset, but there's no more sound of Mar's flute. Not realising the time travel, she yells down at Orphan to look at the sunset and gets confused when he isn't where she left him. I keep climbing and get the last chest here, and another summoning bell. Does anyone ever use these? I climb even higher, where there's another crystal egg piece waiting for Cleo to step on it. Cleo is returned to the proper time and Mar's flute can be heard again. I walk across to a waterfall and climb the vines behind it. After that I run down some stairs and finally catch up to Ma. Cleo asks if Ma came to the island and he did. He's trying to find the song he was playing on his flute. Someone told him they heard the song on Chaos Island. He's hoping the song will lead him to his mother, who got separated from him when he was a baby. The song is the only thing Ma remembers of her. Cleo vows to help him out, even if she doesn't know how. Behind Ma is another door to a cave that leads down to the door near Orphan. Cleo yells at Orphan for disappearing, which confuses him. Then she brings up the sunset, which confuses him more. Ma and Orphan are introduced and Cleo fills Orphan in on his story, telling Orphan he has no choice but to help Ma. I climb back up through the cave and the door up top. 
I head back up to the waterfall where Cleo makes off and crouch down so she can get on top and have Mal lift them into the next area, Water Course Labyrinth. First I climb up onto the wall right at the entrance and run along to pull a lever and open the floodgate. While passing through, Ma hears an organ version of his song, entering a kind of trance and walking off. I now have to follow Ma through the maze until he snaps out of it to fight some monsters in his way. Here is a few knife fish and a sea pig. Ma can shield using his harp, use symbols to charge a magic attack, and plays flute to send out a slow moving projectile. Ma is not my least favourite character, but he is my least favourite to play as. Zeus was slow with his attacks, but Ma is even slower. I'm sick of getting knife fish for the picture book, but when playing as Ma, I'm not going to do that well. Ma then continues walking as if possessed. Ma stops at the next gate, meaning I have to pull another lever to open it and let him keep going. There are three chests in this place, but with nothing new. Behind the gate is a giant machine powered by the water, the source of the music. Ma snaps out of it just as monsters come out of the water. More knife fish and some landos. I'm often again for this battle, so it goes by much quicker. Somehow Lizard Man got added to the picture book despite non being in the fight. However, after the fight, the ceiling caves in and destroys the machine. Everyone crouches from the resulting earthquake. By the time it stops, the song can still be heard coming from a different instrument. Ma says that he must follow the music wherever it takes him. I climb over the wreckage and make my way across the outer walls and pull a lever to close the previous gate so I can use it as a bridge. So this game doesn't have an amazing soundtrack, but this version of Ma's song I really liked despite it being so short. Even two years later after recording this, I still remembered it. I just found it really catchy. I run along these walls pulling more levers to close more gates until I cross over the gate by the entrance and find the exit. Once outside, I follow the path down the side of the mountain and get another battle on the way. Four Votoroos and two Huggers, nothing too special. I do end up swapping back to the Bolt of Thunder because of how slow the smoke of pain is. I get Votoru again for this fight. I continue my descent down the mountain path and Cleo stops, spotting Jado running by higher up. Often doesn't believe her and makes them keep moving. A couple steps later, I have to fight two decks and three Huggers. I got Hugger again for this one. I don't know why I'm still trying for more picture book entries at this point. I've already missed the chance to add Zeus. I head further down to find that the bridge has washed away. Cleo points out a boulder near the top of another waterfall, saying that they could use that to cross. When Orphan asks how they actually get to it, Ma offers to go alone. He crawls through a hole and ends up further upstream. I need to jump across the logs floating downstream. It can be hard because you don't realise how fast the logs are moving until you land on one and can't make the next jump. First I need to wait for the log to get near the tree and jump across to it. The next jump to the platform is easy. The third jump, trying to land on the hill next to the waterfall, is really strict. It takes a couple minutes. The last log I have to ride over to the land next to the other side of the waterfall. From there I can jump up to the boulder. Behind it there's a tree sprout, so Ma plays his song to make a tree grow under the boulder to nudge it off the edge and have it roll into the gap and get stuck. I mean, what other method of moving it was there? Thankfully I don't have to play the journey back. Orphan rightfully asks how the hell, but Cleo tells him it doesn't matter. After crossing the boulder, the song can be heard again, faintly. They identify it as coming from another tower, so they decide to make it their next destination. But first we arrive at Gaia's tomb and reunite with Magnus. Vulcan and Dartin too. Orphan gives Vulcan a beating for getting them stuck on the island. Magnus gets filled in on Mars' story. Magnus says that the only way to get to the tower is by boat, or by walking across frozen water in the winter. They can't wait for winter though. Lucky for them, Vulcan and Dartin know about the crystal egg. They found a piece of it near the endless stairs. Based on their description, Cleo realises she stepped on pieces earlier. So they come up with the idea of getting a piece of the egg, to make it winter so they can cross the frozen water. Orphan gets the location of the endless stairs from Dartin, which makes Vulcan throw a tantrum and earn another beating. He then leaves Magnus to hold Vulcan down while he runs off to the endless stairs. It's not long before Ma has already spotted a piece of the egg, but first I open the chest behind us to get the flute of the wind for Ma. I then walk down all the stairs next to me and then walk up another nearby to find the egg piece. Orphan picks it up and they time travel too, later that night. That's not good enough for Orphan, so we have to find another. Ma spots another one higher up, so I go back down the stairs and up the stairs in this tunnel to find the only other chest for this location and a second piece at the top. This one time travels in two, a night in the same period of time but now it's raining. Orphan gets fed up. The only change is that a previously broken bridge is now not broken so we can cross it and enter Chapel Hill. I cross another bridge and the ground starts shaking. Ma thinks the volcano might be erupting. Orphan thinks the earthquakes have something to do with the music machine being destroyed. There's now a fog obscuring Orphan and Cleo's vision, so Ma takes the lead. Ma has to climb the hill while avoiding falling boulders. It's nothing much to be worried about as being hit on the head by a boulder bigger than you are does so little damage. I make it to the other side and Ma shouts Cleo and Orphan over. We've discovered a building. I climb up some more stairs and reach the top. The only thing here is the whole crystal egg. Can't grab it yet though as a huge gargoyle dragon attacks us. Orphan meets Cleo hide with Ma as he takes on Zapheum, who smashes through the roof. 
I start with a couple of bolts of thunder before he flies around the outside and starts firing his own projectiles at me. I have to predict which segment he's going to land on and fire at it. If I choose wrong, I get shot at. So this fight doesn't take too long. Zafayim does take more damage than normal from a single attack. After enough damage, he returns to fighting me up close. From there, it's just a couple more hits to kill it. For killing Zafayim, I learn the Feathers of the Hurricane, a wind projectile spell. We next see Mara happily carrying the Crystal Egg. Orphan and Cleo have another shouting match after Orphan implies he wants payment for helping Mara. They're interrupted by another earthquake though that makes Mara drop the egg. When he picks it up, he can hear the song again coming from the tower. After that, we return to Gaia's tomb. Orphan says he should find Vulcan and ask him how to use the egg, so I go to the rest house. He asks Magnus where they are, but he's told they took off right after Orphan left for the endless stairs. Sephi and Orphan have the exact same conversation they do in Zeus's story, word for word. Zeus just has generic, this island is too dangerous comments. Orphan asks Mar if he's certain the song has a connection to his mother and isn't just a popular song. Mar says he can just feel something calling him when he hears it. He then leaves. Sephi asks if Mar is travelling alone and says he must be lonely before leaving. Zeus will then ask if Orphan is acquainted with Sephi and then says to keep an eye on her and that there's more to her than meets the eye. Might have been useful information back in Sephi's own story, it's worthless now. He also walks out. Magnus tells Orphan about the underground tunnels and gets Orphan patronising him. Cleo calls Orphan a slacker and tells him to get looking for Vulcan and Dorton again. She's not a slacker because she's on break. Surely she's not that unbearable in Japanese. It has to be a localization or voice direction issue, taking intentional character flaws too far, with nearly every line being a high-pitched yell. Apparently a surname in the series proper is Everlasting, which, after playing this again, sounds less like a name and more like a threat. Now I've heard everything everyone has to say, I go back down to the entrance to watch another bridge appear and ask Mar to rejoin me. Often tries to think of where they can find Vulcan. Aha! I've got it! Watch this! Yeah! Oh! Orphan takes his coin back and demands some answers. After Vulcan tries getting Orphan to hand it over and fails, Dorton says that the only thing they know about it is that it's valuable. Vulcan attacks Orphan through the egg, making him drop it and setting it off. Orphan, Cleo and Mar are then sent to another time, don't comment on it, and go through the new door. In the next room, Mar takes over to jump across some cogs, getting the chests on the way. All you have to do is get to the door on the other side so Mar can crawl under and open the doors for Orphan and Cleo. They then move on to the frozen wasteland. Only now does Cleo wonder what happened to Vulcan and Dorton. Orphan rightly asks who cares. They finally made it winter without even trying. I open one chest and move forward, triggering a battle with three Aegists, two Huggers and a Beholder. I return to using the Hand of Pyro that, combined with the Sword of Justice, makes this easy. Despite that, I still only get Hugger again. I was hoping to finally get Aegist. After the fight, I keep moving forward, opening the chests on the way. Eventually, I reach the other end and the ice collapses beneath me. Because the ice isn't strong enough to support all their weight, Ma goes ahead alone. As Ma, I have to platform over some icy platforms until I end up in a battle with two Groks, a Landos and an Aegist. Mar's attacks actually had the fight go quickly this time, and I got Aegis in the picture book. I make it all the way around the other side and play the flute to make a large pillar fall to create a bridge to the Tower of Sound. Cleo asks more about the song and if Mar's mother was a musician, but Mar doesn't have any answers beyond what he's already told before. Cleo is certain that there'll be clues in the tower. There's a song that can be heard from the tower, but it's not the same as Mar's song. The drawbridge is frozen shut though, so Orphan uses the crystal egg to return them to their proper time. The drawbridge is lowered now, so everyone enters the Tower of Sound. Mark can tell that the music is coming from above. This room contains just a frog thing in the middle and six switches. Touching it plays a segment of the song being heard now. I have to jump on the switches in the right order to play the song right. After getting the far right, I press the last switch to reveal the stairs. When I reach the next floor, I have to fight two man-eaters and some Irus. An easy fight that gets me another man-eater. I then go up to the next floor, which is a maze. Walking a little takes the lights out, replaces the music with an irritating sound and puts a frog icon on the map. I have to spot the frog on the map and walk up to it. Running will make it run away, but you desperately want to run in the hope of catching it quicker to make that noise fuck off. Catching it puts the lights back on and reveals the stairs going up. The next floor has a frog statue jumping between a lot of platforms before landing back on the centre. I have to jump across the same platforms. Getting the last one dumps you at the previous floor. Doing it right has you land next to a chest containing Mars Harp of Darkness. Over the next set of stairs have a battle with four man eaters and a hellfire. Once again, I get man eater for winning. Up the final set of stairs is another giant musical machine and the few chests of the tower. The machine is being powered by Jado playing a large organ. She starts playing to ask who the party are, revealing Mar's song is also being played here. Jado says she's trying to dispel a curse and save the island. Another earthquake starts. Jado says a demon under the island is causing them. The demon is kept asleep as long as the song is playing. 
which is what the huge machine back in the watercourse labyrinth was for. With it broken, she's drawing up plans for the repaired version. The song we can hear now is being played at another tower. When Ma, knowing the song, is brought up and he plays it, talking about his mother, Jada is shocked and clearly knows something, but when Ma asks, she claims to not know anything and tells him to get off the island. They all agree that Jado is hiding something, but no, she isn't going to talk, so they decide to check out the other tower. Across the bridge I exit onto, getting the one chest on the way. Halfway across the bridge, the temperature plummets. While Orphan and Cleo argue, again, over proper use of Orphan's fire spells, the surrounding area freezes. Our next boss, Brizgar, appears, backed up by some Aegists. Brizgar can use her tail to both block and whack. She'll also jump off the bridge and wander about for a bit, giving me the chance to deal with an Aegist. Both the Hand of Pyro and Sword of Justice do a lot of damage to her, making for the quickest boss fight in the game. The spell gain for this fight is the Coldness of Destruction, an ice projectile spell. No scene after the fight, just walk forward, open the chest, and enter the Tower of Mercy. On entering, Ma says that this is definitely his mother's song. We go up the stairs to find another organ being played by Rani as Curious Watchers. Curious asks who they are, and after they say they just met Jado, Curious reveals that in this version of the events, Jado is her mother. With the music machine destroyed, the demon is beginning to awaken and monsters are roaming the island. Should the demon wake up, Chaos Island will sink. Rani is Curious' daughter this time and is the one playing the song non-stop to keep the demon asleep. Curious worries that she will eventually kill herself for exhaustion. Curious's family has been on Chaos Island for generations using the song to keep the demon asleep. M mother Your mother. I don't have a son. Before I can go any further, Rani passes out and the earthquakes resume. Curious tells them to save themselves and leave. Rani wakes up and continues playing as the group discuss the possibility of Curious being Ma's mother. Ma felt she is for certain, but Curious's denial has him doubting. Often suggests they simply go home because there's nothing they can do, but Ma wants to help Rani. He doesn't know why, but he has to. Often teases it as being a crush, which gets him a punishment from Cleo. Everyone returns to Gaia's tomb as the tremors get stronger. Ma suggests using the crystal egg to fix the machine, and they return to the rest house to see if anyone knows how to use it. I first ask Magnus if he knows anything. Of course he doesn't. Often tells him to prepare to escape in case the island sinks. Zeus has never heard of it, he's living soon anyway because in this version of events, his daughter was never here. Sethi also doesn't know, and says she came here for nothing before she leaves too. That's all for the rest house, and on the way out we get one more bridge in the entrance before rejoining Ma. The other two haven't had any luck either. Luckily Jado is around. Often asks if Rani is okay. Jado doesn't think she has much left in her, but she's on her way to fix the music machine. Often offers to help, but Jado says he can't. But she changes her tune when Cleo mentions the crystal egg. She says she can use it to fix the machine, and everyone hurries through the new door. Behind the door, I have another easy platforming challenge with Ma. It's just some slow moving platforms with chests off to the side, nothing special, and I walk through the exit, taking me back to the watercourse labyrinth. The tunnels are full of monsters, so often has Ma take Jado to the machine while he and Cleo deal with them. As Ma, I have to walk really slow while dealing with the flies because of just how slow Jado walks. There is absolutely nothing else to talk about here. I inch my way through the labyrinth, or in the chest on the way, and slowly taking out any flies. Also, Jado can be knocked down if she takes too many hits. This makes you start this entire section back from the beginning. This is the worst section of the game, by far. Five minutes of going forward one step and playing the flute later, I also get a battle. Just four Votoroos and a Landos. Killing them gets me Beholder somehow. Thankfully, Orphan and Cleo catch up in time for another battle against two Votoru and Landos. I get Votoru again for this one. After this fight, we're already at the machine. Jado then uses the crystal egg to restore the machine. However, it still isn't playing. While Jado tinkers with it, she says that for generations, her family has been cursed with the task of keeping the island floating with the music. For some reason, only music played by a young girl will keep the demon asleep. When Ma asks if it has to be a girl, if it will work if a boy plays the music, Jado says it is possible, but a boy playing can only keep it asleep for a short period of time. Not only that, but it also kills the boy, meaning that Rani is the only one who can do anything. Jado built the machine to play itself, hoping to relieve the burden on Rani, but it breaks down often, keeping their family trapped on the island. Jado gets the machine working again, however they were too late and the earthquakes ramp up. The seal is broken and the beast has awakened. Once again, the ceiling collapses and the machine is destroyed. However, a new tunnel has opened. Jado says it leads to the underground labyrinth, where the demon lives. The group sets off into the tunnel, but Jado demands that they leave, especially Ma. But they're set on killing the demon. She tries once again to at least stop Ma, but he goes with them. Oh gods, please protect my grandson. 
Well, it was pretty obvious. We go forward and drop down the hole leading to the final area, the underground labyrinth. Orphan goes on alone to deal with the traps. We've been here before in other stories, but with a different layout. It's the same traps though, spike crushers, spiked balls, arrows from the walls and swinging blades. I first press a switch to set off the balls further on so I can actually move down that tunnel. The next switch has me jumping over lava while avoiding getting hit by more blades. It takes me a little bit. This switch also sets us off a ball further on. This tunnel has a switch for moving the ball again. The part after it has entrances to the next tunnel blocked by blades that don't give you much room to pass them. Everyone has a quick talk wondering about where this tunnel will lead to. This causes another disagreement between Orphan and Cleo over whether or not they'll find pirate treasure here, and Cleo mocking Orphan for being poor. Orphan and Ma walk off without her, which leads to Cleo mocking a Votaru, kicking it away, and then being attacked by a swarm of them. This puts me in a fight with a few, along with a man-eater and a dex. This gets me Votaru yet again. Taking just a few steps after has me fighting two lizard men, two Votarus, and a Hellfire. Winning this one adds Hellfire again. I then drop down a hole into the next room. This place is almost pitch black. Cleo manages to find a torch and light it. I have to walk along this maze lighting the torches and getting the last few chests in the game. Failing will start you back at the beginning with all the torches you've lit undone. After a few failures I manage to reach the exit on the other side. Cleo says this is the place but they don't see a demon. On the other end of the room is a group of blocks near some holes in the ground and an inscribed riddle basically saying, fill me. The positioning of the blocks was resonating with the music to prevent the earthquakes, but the ceiling collapse has ruined that, so I have to play as Ma and push the blocks into the holes. However, this just calls the demon. It's an eyeball hiding in a huge spinning block called Beogray. I have four targets and it will form the blocks into other shapes to attack me with. I have to hit the eyeball to deal damage, but the eyeball is nowhere to be seen, so I can't do anything. Damn! I'm hitting it with everything I have! But it's no use! It's just no use! Mar? Mar, no! Don't do it! This reveals the eyeball. After hitting it, it spins around the arena preventing any attacks from connecting. After hitting it three times more, it forms on either side of me and tries to crush me. At one point it formed this block into a long line and wears them around, but I knock it out of that one. It also separates every block and just throws them all at me. I do well, but Ma passes out, leaving me with no way to harm it again. I just have to survive for another minute until Ma forces himself back up and starts playing again, so I can start hurting it again. Cleo begs him to stop because it's killing him. Beogre pulls out some new attacks, such as forming into a huge tower and falling on me. Ma continues to play, ejecting Beogre from its blocks and letting me attack it easier. Here he starts flying around and firing lasers at me. It'll return to the block as it spins, but leaves when using them for attacks. It takes a few cycles of this, slowly whittling away the last of its health, but I eventually get that last hit in. Beogre rises into the air and explodes. For it, I'm rewarded with the final spell, the Hammer of Evil, a darkness elemental spell. With the demon dead, Ma stops playing a song and collapses. After he thanks Cleo for being his first friend, Rani, Curious and Jado arrive. Curious asks if Mark can forgive his mother, while Rani asks why he did it for her, even without knowing she was his sister. Jado says that she was the one who had Mar sent away from the island. Curious was against it, but knew that if he stayed, the curse would kill him from playing the song. Mar forgives her, just happy to have finally met his mother and knowing he has a sister. Mar gives his flute to Orphan, believing it belongs with him now, then he dies, and Orphan's reaction slightly ruins it. Mar! As Curious cries, the screen fades out to the boat. Then we get this. Do you think Mara was happy at the end? Meaning his mother and all? Well, I suppose he's the only one that could really answer that question. Well, I think he was happy, don't you? Cleo, you're not crying, are you? Fucking hell, Magnus. Between the two, I tended to find Cleo the more annoying one, but Magnus just snatched the worst arsehole stars at the very last second. Even worse, he doesn't even realise what he said was wrong after Cleo tells him off. Oh man, what did I do? Even Orphan is affected by Mar's sacrifice after keeping up his cool and caring attitude at the end of the last two stories. But we aren't done yet. What the? What is this? These are three souls who have fulfilled their destinies. Destiny? What are you talking about? You have received something valuable from each of the three that sleep before you. You now possess the key to unlock the truth. Unlock the truth? Orphan, I have one more thing to ask. To fulfill your destiny and set yourself free, 
you must also release us from the chains of eternity. Hold on. I don't understand. Have you not sensed that you too, Orphan, have become a prisoner, bound by the chains of eternity? What? Have you not wondered how it is that you know the story of each of those that sleep before you? Orphan has finally realized that he's been reliving the journey from the sinking boat to Chaos Island. Ronnie simply says that soon Orphan will know the truth and he must destroy Gaia. But yeah, Mars' story was my favourite, despite having the worst section of gameplay in the game. The music part makes it stand out more and the Rani, Curious, Jado trio all felt properly used. Cleo is also easier to deal with looking out for Mars than for Zeus. Suddenly the trio is back in Gaia's tomb, confused. Orphan lets viewers know they've been trapped in a loop from the beginning. The three gifts Orphan received return to their true form and combine to form a pyramid shape. It's a map of Chaos Island. Often figures that the glow on this map is showing the location of Gaia. After saving, they've entered Gaia's lair. There's a huge machine floating above the same three-eyed machine we saw all the way back when the boat sank the first time. Often gets close to it and there's a flash. He sees a boat with Magnus, Cleo and the other three below him with a dragon's eye floating above them. Then he sees himself show up before he wakes up back in Gaia's lair, with three stones falling in front of him. Projections of Sethi, Zeus and Mar appear floating above them, asleep. They're nothing but puppets. Puppets? Isn't that right, Ronnie? Show yourself. I know you're here somewhere. Yes, you are correct. The three you see before you were once normal people, with normal lives. Who, who are you? However, once they touched a dragon's eye, their destiny was forever altered. They were compelled to travel to this island to take on their new roles their new life. They are now nothing more than pawns, actors in Gaia's twisted play. What is this dragon's eye? It is what Gaia uses to plant the false memories it creates into the mind of a person chosen to be the actor. It then records all the emotions the actors experience as they wander through the imaginary lives that Gaia creates for them. Basically, Gaia feeds on the emotions it records to sustain itself, often he's sickened by what he's been told. When Magnus asks why it does this, Rani doesn't know. It was all decided by the Ancient Ones, who created Gaia. Rani's role for an untold amount of time was to bring people to the island to be cast members. Well, she says they. Remember the dying machine creatures in the animated cutscene before Mars story? Rani just wants it all to end, which is why she brought Orphan to Chaos Island. She asks him to insert the Dragon Eyes into Gaia. Originally, when their uses ran out, a cast member would insert their Dragon Eye into Gaia and be put into an eternal sleep in this room. The trio are also trapped here. If they don't free themselves, they'll be stuck repeating journeys on Chaos Island forever. So Orphan puts the eyes in. Orphan! Edo. Unit. What is the meaning of this? <sighs> the memories contained in the dragon's eyes do not correspond to those who installed them. Those who inserted the eyes were not those chosen by Gaia. If the memories are not coordinated, our mind will there will be... A logic error will occur. The errors will compound. Eventually, your system will overload. Edo unit, you are acting illogically. Yes. I probably am. Explain! For eons, I have watched as you played with the lives of innocent people. You forced them to play their roles in your sick, twisted little dramas over and over again until their hearts were left barren and empty of emotion. Then you simply threw them away to make room for the next unfortunate souls. What reason do I have to exist? Day after day, century after century, I do as I am ordered. I want it to end. Gaia orders the Edo unit to remove the dragon's eyes, but she refuses. Gaia starts throwing a shit fit as the Edo unit begs Orphan to destroy it and set her free. The floor opens beneath Orphan to reveal Gaia's full body. Final boss time. When I was a child, I beat Gaia the first time I tried. For once, I did worse nearly two decades later. Gaia has five parts, two arms, two cannons and its disproportionately tiny head. 
Aiming for the cannon will have it blocked with its arms. It will also use its arms to try caving your skull in. First you must keep spamming the hand of Pyro on the arms while blocking all attacks. After a while it will send out some smaller robots to surround you and fire some lasers. They must be destroyed first before you can attack Gaia again. They are the biggest problem here as their lasers come out so quick your shield cannot block them in time once they're fired. Gaia also has a big laser it fires from his eyes. When I destroy Gaia's second arm, it hits me with a laser that leaves me a hit from death, so I restart the fight. Second time I take out both arms relatively quick. With both arms gone it charges both cannons. I hit it in the head and now it's sending out four drones to attack me. A few hits to the head and I'm having to deal with six. When I hit it once more and it sends out seven, I just don't have the health to deal with it and I reset the battle again. I manage even more damage the third time, but with no extra health left and all those drones heading for me, I try again. This goes on for a while. About 20 minutes into this, the worst happens. I get killed, leaving me stuck watching the entire 8 minute unskippable cutscene leading up to the fight. At one point I try the smoke of pain, but it just isn't as effective on Gaia so I abandon that idea and go back to the hand of Pyro. I also move on to destroying the cannons too. There's no point really, they're easy to block and it just adds more time for the drones to whittle you down. But after over an hour of this, I get the final hit in. I don't know how I did this the first time at 9. Gaia's body explodes, dropping the head on the floor. Now, I can finally be free. Orphan, take out the dragon's eyes. Then Gaia will be- You. Are. All. Fools. Whoa! He's still alive! Without the master, the slave has no future. You have doomed us both. Ah! Ah! What's wrong? My body, my body is changing. Oh, this is just as I feared. Without Gaia, I cannot exist! Oh. What's happening? I am merely a puppet of Gaia. The sole purpose of my existence is to play the various roles that Gaia provides. When my scene ends, I die and am created anew for the next. A never-ending pantomime repeated for all eternity. I wanted to drop the curtain. I wanted to put an end to it all. Gaia was right. What a fool I was to believe I could live without Gaia. Orphan. I'm here. I am sorry for everything. You could not give me freedom, but at least you have released me from the chains of eternity that bound me to an eternity of sadness. Thank you. I would have loved to have seen your world, the real world, just once. I wanted to talk to people in the real world, not this make-believe world. Gotta say, at nine years old I found watching this scene a little disturbing. Seeing the character who was helpful and likeable in all three roots reduced to what looked like a skeleton to me back then was one thing. Plus all that stuff she was saying about dying and being created anew was confusing my dumb nine-year-old brain and not helping. I just couldn't comprehend it. It was one of the few things I could remember whenever this game would pop up in my head. Orphan's final comments about not knowing who would create this entire situation, hoping he would never know, while not a line I remembered, probably summed up how I felt watching it as a child. Chaos Island overgrows pretty quickly as everyone leaves by boat. Orphan still has one of the dragon's eyes and throws it into the ocean. We then get the credits, where we can see the three actors back in their own real lives. Sefi dancing on stage, Zeus at home with his daughter, and Mar asleep on his real mother's lap. Often Sky of Sorcery doesn't really hold up that great. I don't at all think it's a bad game. I did find the story okay, with Mars being a highlight along with that final segment leaving an impact on me. 
I also found the puzzle solving to be fine, but that battle system was just strange to try playing coming back to it. Not to mention my frustration with not being able to complete the picture book thanks to unseen requirements. I know for a fact I never got Cleo, Zeus or Mar added to it for example, but escorting Jado aside, I didn't dislike playing it. It's a strange game to explain the appeal of, there's just some weird thing that made it intriguing to me back then and coming back to. Don't know if it's the music or the atmosphere or what. I do have a slight interest in checking out the original series now, but I'm not rushing out to. It was a real struggle whether I'd rank it above or below Hulk. You could certainly argue that Hulk is a better made game and even more fun at times, but often shortcomings bothered me less, so it just edged it out. But yeah, not as good as I remember, but still enjoyable. I'd still say check it out if you see it really cheap, like for a couple quid. May come back if the picture book methods are ever found.